Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our fifth and final talk about integrity. We'll be taking a broad view of our topic today, looking at integrity from the level of society and evolution. We'll see how life itself can inform us in ways that will improve the likelihood of our civilization enduring over the long term. We'll also remember how within our very bodies, there is an intuitive wisdom that can guide us. I hope you find this talk helpful. Let's begin. So the topic is integrity, and we've been looking at it as depending on the creative interplay between two complementary qualities, separation and connection. Early in the history of life on Earth, organisms were mostly separate from one another in the sense that they consisted of very small cells similar to what we call bacteria today. They were often present in very large numbers and they certainly interacted with each other, but they did not form multicellular organisms of the kind we're familiar with now. In the first talk of this series, I reviewed how it has been about 3.7 billion years since life began. And humans, with our complex brains, upright posture, and dexterous hands, only appeared on the scene very recently, only 2 million years ago, and modern humans only two or three hundred thousand years ago. Once humanity arose, it right from the beginning showed evidence of the traits that have made us into such a successful species. In particular, humans have worked cooperatively in small tribes and villages, sharing the work of keeping the community alive through division of labor and the development of tools and other cultural artifacts. For a long time, humanity continued in that mode. But then, with the rise of agriculture, things began to move very rapidly, so that it was a mere 10,000 years between the era when humans lived in these small villages and tribes to where we are today with people living in highly populous urban environments with advanced technologies, a lot of very impressive structures that have been built and a globe spanning communication network. The progress has been so rapid that we've outstripped our capacity to remain in balance. And there are a lot of issues that confront us today that call into question the likelihood of our civilization holding together over the long haul. There is a real concern that we might suffer some kind of collapse, as has happened to many prior civilizations. Our problems, as we know, include the ecological, the social, the political, and so on. I want to bring this question of the long-term viability of our civilization to the center of today's discussion. As I mentioned in the first talk, one way of interpreting the problems we face today is that we have overemphasized individuality. I put on the screen here a picture of a famous cultural icon, Clint Eastwood, who has played characters who were loners, highly self-reliant, mistrustful of others, violent, and on the positive side, very prone to protect the vulnerable, etc. There is much to admire in this rugged individualism that we think of as characteristic of life in the United States, but it can, of course, be overdone. Its complement would be another cultural icon, John Lennon, who wrote songs about how love is all we need and we can come together in harmony, etc. As I said in that first talk, because I came of age in the hippie era, 
I tend to favor the view of John Lennon over the example of Clint Eastwood's characters. But I do truly believe that the issue here is one of balance that if we overplay either one of these roles, we're likely to undermine rather than further our personal, social, and civilizational integrity. I think that the future of our civilization, if it's to survive over the long haul in a way that is sustainable on planet Earth and that serves people with a fair degree of equity, that long-term survival depends on restoring a healthier balance between the two modes. Ever since I began teaching programs called Mindful Biology, I've worked from the premise that life itself can teach us much about how to thrive at the level of our individual experience, our communities, and even the culture at large that we can see life as a kind of classroom or teacher. Life can also be a sort of enforcer. It's well known from population biology that if a given species becomes overabundant, something will happen sooner or later to bring the population back under control. There might be a new illness that spreads through the species or a new predator might emerge or there simply could be a scarcity of resources that causes a collapse. Humanity is not immune to these effects. Because of our technologies, we can buffer ourselves for a time, but sooner or later, ecology will have the final word if we don't alter our trajectory before then. And surely it would be easier on most of us if we changed how our civilization impacts the planet prior to reaching some sort of ecological crisis. Well, life can teach us in less punishing ways. To see how this might work, we can look at the evolution of flight. So many organisms have evolved the capacity to fly. We're all familiar with birds, and we see bats less often, but we know they exist, we know what they look like. Birds and bats evolved flight independently of one another, and the structures of their wings are different enough to make the independent evolution obvious. But despite the fact that birds and bats evolved flight independently, there is a broad similarity in appearance. That is to say, both birds and bats have wings with large surface area, and they both have relatively small, lightweight bodies. Prior to the end of the dinosaur era, there were creatures like this that we now call pterosaurs. So these were dinosaurs that were not in the lineage that eventually led to birds. This was a separate line that evolved flight completely independently. And again, the bone structure is very different from that seen in either birds or bats. And yet the overall appearance of the organism is somewhat similar. There are, again, wings with large surface area and a relatively small, lightweight body. If we go to an even more distantly related class of organisms, the insects, we can see, again, the same principles. Wings with large surface area, small, lightweight bodies. And when humans devised flying machines, they ended up looking much the same. Now, you might think this was because humans were imitating birds when they developed the early flying machines, and there is some truth in this. But the main reason that airplanes resemble birds and bats and pterosaurs and dragonflies has to do with fundamental principles of physics, airflow, and what we today call aerodynamics. So for anything to fly, whether an organism or a machine, there needs to be a wing of the proper shape and it needs to move through the atmosphere at the proper angle. When the shape and angle of the wing are optimal, then air is forced to flow over the top of the wing faster than it flows over the bottom. This difference in the rate of airflow between the top and the bottom generates what we call lift, 
This is what holds the plane or the bird or bat in the air. Now there's a countervailing force that opposes the lift, and that is the weight of either the organism or the machine. So of course the upward force of the lift has to be at least equal to the downward force of the weight for the plane or the organism to fly. If there's too much weight relative to lift, the plane or the organism will descend and it may not get off the ground in the first place. Now, if we were aircraft designers, we might naively think that, well, the answer then is to absolutely limit the weight as much as possible and make the wings as large with as much lift as we can. And then, of course, it will be quite easy for the plane to stay in the air. And there's certainly some truth in this. The problem is that we build planes not just so they can stay in the air, but so that they can carry cargo. And that cargo could be passengers or it could be all sorts of other things. But the idea is the plane won't be useful unless it does, in fact, have a substantial capacity to carry weight. So the usefulness of the plane needs to depend both on the lift, which holds everything up, and sufficient capacity to carry weight to make it functional. So if we return to the question of our civilization, and think of what is going to keep it going over the long haul so it doesn't crash. We could say that there does need to be a kind of balance and we can go back to our original language and those two cultural icons. And we might say that the connection and the ethos of John Lennon serve as a kind of upward lift to civilization. They inspire us to dream and envision so that ability to dream and come together and work toward common goals is very important. But so too is a element of groundedness. It's necessary for us to make sure that we're getting sufficient food and that we have the right shelter and that we're protected from the threats that we inevitably face. So the quality of separation is the grounding element that balances out the dreaminess, we might say, of connection. So when we return to this question of how do we proceed as a civilization, how can we get through the crises we currently face and build a sustainable culture, we can keep the necessity for balance in mind and then also look at the examples life has placed before us. Because life has in fact solved this problem multiple times. There are organisms that live in highly populous colonies or societies. Examples include termites, a termite mound shown on the left, and ants, the cast of an underground ant colony shown on the right. In both cases, the termite and the ants live in these highly populous, complex societies in a sustainable way. Biologists look at these colonies as being, in effect, superorganisms, so that the unit of life in the case of the termite or the ant, or we might add in the honeybee and other organisms, the unit that matters is the colony as a whole. The individual termite or ant is important, but the reproduction and the survival really depend on the whole complex, the whole society, the whole superorganism. One step we could take as humans, as we contemplate how to move forward and solve some of our problems, is to begin to think of our globe spanning civilization as a single superorganism, made up, of course, of individual humans, but the health of the whole is fundamentally more important than the health of any single individual in terms of the long-term survival of the species and the civilization. Now the termite and ant and other biological colonial organisms have solved this problem by balancing the health and well-being of the colony as a whole against the health and well-being of the individual members. So of course the colony has to operate in a way that allows for the thriving of individual termites or ants. 
At the same time, the individual termites or ants are designed, that is to say, innately inclined to place the needs of the colony before their own welfare. And ants and termites will readily sacrifice themselves to protect and preserve the colony at large. So this is an important principle that the colony is ultimately much more important than any individual. Now we as humans are not termites, we're not ants, and so we're unlikely to behave like these much simpler organisms, simpler in terms of their nervous system and their capacity for uh, conscious deliberation and so on. Because we're so different, our solutions will have to look at least somewhat different but the principle that our individual well-being is subordinate to the well-being of a whole still applies. And this is recognized, of course. This is why we have legal systems. This is why we pay taxes, etc. But we need to perhaps bring it more to the foreground and really emphasize how necessary it is for the civilization as a whole to survive how that's far more important than the life and well-being of any particular individual, even though the well-being of those individuals does matter, and the whole point of civilization is to promote it. Well, let's go back to the evolution of life on Earth. It began, as I said, with these individual separate bacteria, and currently among many other life forms, we have our human form that's capable of such a connected lifestyle with these complex arrangements between people and even between people and other species. Well, a lot happened between the beginning of life on Earth and where we are today. And I want to look at one important transition point along the way. After about three billion years of evolution, the first functional multicellular organisms of the sort we're familiar with today emerged. An example of this is what we now call a sponge. So what happened in the evolution of multicellular life is that enormous numbers of individual cells that historically had lived separately had now aggregated into colonial structures with divisions of labor in essence, they became social. So that instead of having lots of individual separated cells, we now had cells living with a high degree of connection, interaction, sophistication, etc. So the multicellular forms of life that emerged after three billion years of evolution solved the problem that the termites have solved and the problem that we as a species are still working on. That is to say, how to develop a functional colony of multiple, that is to say, numerous individuals that cooperate in ways that both promote individual well-being, but in particular prioritize the health of the superorganism, or in the case of the sponge, the multicellular organism. To look at this a little further, we can examine how sponges are constructed. They're quite simple. They consist of a central cavity with a wall that surrounds it that is porous. This is what makes sponges spongy. They have porous walls. The most abundant cell type in the wall is a cell that looks, in the simplest terms, rather like this shaped more or less like a cube with a little tail coming off one side. And this tail, in effect, wags. And that wagging creates a current of seawater. You'll notice to generate this image, I've used a video of a sperm cell and attached it to our schematic sponge cell. The flagellum, that is what the tail of the sperm is called, is actually structurally quite similar to the flagellum of the sponge cells. Making an, a point as an aside here that biology has a strong tendency to reuse successful solutions. But when you take many of these cube-shaped sponge cells with tails that wag and propel seawater, you end up with a circulation of that water 
The water moves through the porous wall of the sponge and then up the central cavity and out the top. As the water moves past all the cells in the sponge, those individual cells are able to pull out little bits of organic debris and microorganisms upon which they feed. So this circulation, which is generated collectively, allows the individual cells to find nourishment. In effect, what we have here is a kind of circulatory system, obviously much simpler than our own circulatory system, but serving the same function. Another system that we share with sponges, although of course it's much simpler in the case of the sponge, is a skeleton. So sponges have in them little calcium mineral structures called spicules that give the sponge a more cohesive and coherent shape. That is to say, rather than just being a jelly-like blob, the sponge can hold its shape in the face of strong wave action and other forces. There are even cells in the sponge that serve as a kind of immune system. So we can enlarge one of these and we may recognize it from the last talk. It's a macrophage, which is to say it's a cell capable of engulfing and digesting bacteria. And this is very helpful to the sponge because there are, of course, lots of bacteria around and they would infect and digest the sponge were it not for this system that defends against them. So even in the case of the earliest multicellular organisms, we already see the establishment of the basic systems that are necessary for multicellular life to work. There's a circulatory system, a skeletal system, an immune system. Again, these are much simpler in the sponge than they are in humans and other multicellular organisms, but they functionally work in much the same way. I like to think of this as evidence of life's intelligence. Through random variations in genes and natural selection, and at some level, perhaps just the mystery of life, the process of species evolving through time has led to a lot of innovation, the solution of many problems that face organisms, and highly sophisticated and rather amazing structures. Now, of course, the origin of this intelligence could be debated. There are those who would insist it must be due to a designing deity. I don't want to take on that debate. I would just look at life at its face and say that evidently it is quite capable of creatively finding solutions to the problems faced by organisms. Which is to say it is quite capable, if we allow it, to find solutions to the problems facing the superorganism we call human civilization. In order to tap into that intelligence, it's going to rely on each of us tapping into the intelligence we contain in our own bodies. Because after all, we have within us all of these sophisticated systems of circulation, skeletal support, immune protection, and of course, a powerful uh, organ that we call a brain that allows us to reason and interpret the environment and so on. We have all this in us, courtesy of the long running intelligence of life on Earth. And so we can find within us, not just within our brains, but really throughout our whole organism, some answers to the problems life poses. What I'd like to focus on here is our ethical sensibility. We have a felt sense of right or wrong. Although we can certainly think about and write about and debate ethics, they come into being prior to our capacity for language. So it's been shown in many ways that even children that have very little or no language have a capacity to recognize the value of helping one another. They do it spontaneously, as we see in this picture. They don't need to think that this is a nice behavior. They don't have to say, well, gee, wouldn't it be a good thing for me to help my companion here by feeding this person. 
Later in life, when language develops, those thoughts may arise, but the behavior comes prior to that capacity to think about it and make a rational decision. It's something that seems to just be innate in humans and probably many other animals. This tendency to want to treat others the way we need to be treated has a name. We call it the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So again, this isn't something that philosophers devised. They may have come up with the phrasing for it, but the tendency to treat others the way we need to be treated was something that we came into the world possessing even before we could think or talk. Children also have a sense of unfairness prior to the capacity for language. They will react negatively when they see someone cheating, for instance. So our sense of wrongness is just as innate. So each one of us can imagine how horrible it would be to have a thermonuclear device exploded over our home region. None of us wants that to happen. We think of it as an absolute nightmare. And so we can also predict quite reasonably that people on the other side of the world would rather avoid being bombed with thermonuclear weapons too. So this brings us to another phrasing of the golden rule said in a kind of mirror image way, do nothing to others you would not have done to you. And again, this is something that we don't actually have to think about or name in words, we feel it without really resorting to a lot of logical thought, although the thought can be helpful in terms of figuring out how to solve problems like weapons proliferation and so on. But the basic feel of what's right and wrong is part of life's inherent and innate intelligence. Now, if we return to our two cultural icons, we can see that they both have a role to play in this dynamic. John Lennon is typifying the idea that we should treat others the way we want to be treated. And at its best, the ethos of the Clint Eastwood character protects us from people that would prefer to do something to us that they would never have done to themselves if they could avoid it. In other words, the thinking typified by the songs of John Lennon helps us support one another, whereas the style typified by Clint Eastwood characters, helps us protect against parasites, predators, etc., whether human or otherwise. There's another way to talk about some of this that traces back to the Buddhist tradition. Hatred never ceases through hatred, but by love alone is healed. This is the ancient and eternal law. It's the tendency we have to vilify people with different viewpoints that is really the problem. It's not that we disagree. It's not that we don't need to protect ourselves from genuine harm. But when we do something in order to protect ourselves or others, if we do it with an active hatred, we're just going to perpetuate the cycle of violence and trauma. Only if we act protectively out of love, treating people as gently as we can in order to prevent them from causing harm, only if we operate that way will we actually work in a direction that serves the integrity of our individual lives, our communities, and the global civilization, not to mention the ecosphere. Well, reaching this kind of balance, replacing hatred with love, etc., is a tall order. Because not only do we have to achieve it locally in our own psyches, we also have to somehow or another make it part of our local communities, our institutions, our nations, and our technologies. It looks pretty daunting when we see civilization as it stands today to make that kind of adjustment. But the one place where we know we can have at least some positive impact is in our own individual body and mind, that is to say, in our own organism. We can work to improve our own capacity for integrity. And as we tap into our deep moral 
sense of things, our innate feelings of right and wrong. And as we balance our own tendency to connect with others when it's safe and separate from others when necessary, as we work all that out and become better at it, we will calm down, make more skillful decisions, and importantly, we will inspire those around us to do the same. And as they work to improve their own capacity for integrity, we in turn will be inspired. And this is, I think, the only way we can really move forward as a civilization is on this individual and local community level. And granted, we have social media and other technologies that pose challenges of their own, but we always can begin in our own experience in our own organism. And when we reach into our own organism, what we find there is that innate intelligence, which can guide us. And if many people started to tap into it and operate from it, we would stand a pretty good chance of working out a way to bring our civilization through its current obstacles and establish a long-term sustainable culture that would protect the resources and life forms of the earth, that is to say the biosphere, and also treat individuals with sufficient fairness and equal distribution of resources, etc., in order to make the social environment much less contentious, to help people feel safer, more at ease, and so they can pursue their own skills and gifts and creative ideas and continue to uplift civilization, moving it forward, not just through the decades, but hopefully through the millennia. In other words, we can tap into this innate intelligence and use it to solve the problems of multi-individual societies, to work within the constraints and create a civilization that can truly soar. A nice meditation that can help with this is to simply sit still, focus on the breathing and all the ways in which the body takes care of life. Remember that it's digesting food and maintaining an upright posture and sensing the surroundings and feel that living intelligence and feel how much further it goes than our rational thought and our capacity to form logical conclusions and so on, that there is this deep intelligence in life and we can have faith in it.